Good evening, everybody. I'm Gwen, I'm Gwen Robinson, uh, president of the Foreign Correspondents Club and editor-at-large of the Nikkei Asian Review. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. We all know why we're here. I'd like to give a very big welcome to Kun Tanaton, Kun Pita, Kun Panika and uh, their entire uh, group. We've got a few of uh, MPs of the former Future Forward here tonight as well as uh, some of the team that is working on, uh, on uh, their uh, forward strategy, which you will hear about. This is the fourth time that Kuntanaton and his team have appeared here. Some may ask why. Um, I'd just like to make a very strong point here that uh, even more in this shrinking political space, we feel it's very important to provide a venue, a forum for voices from across the political spectrum. We have had a standing invitation to Prime Minister Prayut for five years to come and speak. And we don't expect him to turn up at the club, but we, uh, we do have a traditional uh, annual Prime Minister's dinner, which uh, almost every Prime Minister, I think, in uh, recent history have, uh, has uh, observed, including uh, the, his immediate predecessor. Uh, actually, um, he has actually accepted for this year, but that has already been put off once and uh, uh, it is uh, to be decided. So anyway, this is just to underline the role of the Foreign Correspondents Club. Uh, we continue to give a, um, a forum for all political voices and I think particularly now it's an important time. Uh, I'd also like to say that next week, on Wednesday, we are having an evening for the young activists, uh, also from across the political spectrum, who you are seeing take to the, well, at least university campuses, if not the streets, yet. Uh, so next Wednesday, you can come and hear from some of them what they're doing and why. Uh, and the following week, we have uh, the annual general meeting of the Foreign Correspondents Club uh, for voting a new... Uh, board and uh, I hope that if you're not a member you will consider joining the club and supporting it because right now it's a real struggle to keep this place going. Uh, we really feel that there's a role and a need for it and you would be very surprised how cheap it is to join particularly if you're either 60 and over, a Thai journalist, a, um, a variety, an academic, all kinds of uh, levels of membership. The forms are there please uh, at the reception, so please uh, think about it and support us and come to any of the programs that interest you. Uh, and without any further delay, I'd like to turn over to my colleague, Vice President Jonathan Head, who will introduce and moderate Kun Tanaton Kun Pita. So, and then we will have a question and answer. So save your questions up for the end. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, you know, we've <coughs> this club, I think we've, to some degree, tracked the fortunes of Future Forward from its beginnings really not so long ago. I mean, it's only two years ago that the uh, party was formed. Uh, we have, have had Kuntanaton, as Gwen said, here four times, but so much has happened to the party that every time he comes here to speak, there's an entirely new situation to talk about. So it's through no fault of his own that news keeps happening to him and his party, and therefore no fault of ours that he keeps being a relevant news story. But we are very pleased to have him. And I think in particular, because it is so obviously difficult for dissenting voices to be heard in Thailand and to get space, uh, the whole point of Future Forward, at least the hope that was invested in it by so many people, was that it would be a voice for people who wanted something different in Parliament, and as that voice has now been shut down, clearly they're going to have to find another way to put forward the ideas that they have been, uh, has been part of their policy platform and to reflect the hopes for change that many ties clearly still have. And that's what tonight's program is all about. We are, of course, as you will understand, constrained by very, very strict laws on saying anything at all about court judgments, in particular the Constitutional Court. There are new laws that make it 
pretty much impossible to say anything negative about the Constitutional Court, so we will bear that in mind. We'll not be reflecting so much on the court judgment, but much more on what the future is for what was Future Forward uh, and what the tremendous momentum the party got last year, how that can best be used now. Quintana Ton, can Peter, could I ask you both to come up and, and uh, put yourselves in the hot seat? <clears throat> Peter, do you want to stay off the stage while Quintana Ton speaks? No, since you have me here, I'll be here. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I think we all appreciate that there is a different role for both of them now, and that is uh, explicitly stated. You have a parliamentary faction and you have a movement. And Quintana Ton, perhaps you could um, start by explaining to people here, having lost your party, what you're now going to do with your movement. First of all, I would like to thank the management of FCCT for accepting us here tonight. And I would like to thank um, you all for the attention you have for us as well. Um, I think it is a very interesting time in Thai politics. And I would like to share with you tonight um, our plan, what we plan to do next, and why we plan it that way. The former, the former Future Forward Party was 508 days old when it was dissolved. The party won 81 members of the parliament after the election, gaining a popular vote of 6.3 million votes. And yet, it was dissolved by the ruling of seven constitutional, constitutional court judges on 21st February 2020. The court ruling forces us to evolve. Future Forward Party is a vehicle, a, a vehicle for people who say enough is enough. For those who know that without the intervention of the unelected, undemocratic forces, militarily or otherwise, Thailand can be a better place a more equitable society for all. It was a vehicle for those who are ready to fight for democracy because they, they know that the future of their children is here and now. The party was dissolved. The vehicle shattered. But the people will continue the journey towards our shared destination. We announce here and again that we will not surrender. It's too soon to cry. It's too soon to give up. As long as the junta rules, the struggle continues. Many parties have been dissolved before us. The establishment, they think that dissolving political parties could destroy oppositions, <laughs> allowing them a firmer grip of power. We will prove them wrong. We will prove this time is different. This is not the end of the story as they had hoped. For us, it's just the end of chapter one. Now, chapter two begins. The court ruling forces us to evolve. As once the leader of the third largest political party in Thailand, I do understand the power, the constraint, and the limitations of a political party. Now I'm no longer a part of any political party. I no longer possess any power to shape laws. But I also no longer have the constraints and the limitations arising from electoral and political party regulations. I can move more freely now. And with that in mind, I have announced the creation of the Future Forward Movement soon after the party was dissolved. What is Future Forward Movement? Future Forward Movement is a network of like-minded people. It's a movement rather than an organization it is liquid rather than solid. It has no legal entity. 
we will start with 60,000 strong members of the former Future Forward Party. We will gather people of all age groups, occupations, and genders who are determined to fight against the rule of the junta and to promote equality and democracy in this country. Future Forward Movement will have three missions. First, to challenge in the upcoming local elections. Local politics in Thailand has long been dominated by a handful of families. These families often use money and the threat of violence to monopolize their powers. And very often, you find these families in support of the military intervention into politics. We believe change is long overdue. We believe that with good policies, with determination, a strong stance against vote buying and money politics, and by maximizing the use of technology, we could bring freshness to local politics in the same way we have done to politics at the national level. With the pressure from the competitions we install, local politicians will have to adapt their ways of doing politics or risk becoming irrelevant. That's what we plan to achieve. Mission number two, because we believe that ideas are stronger than guns, ballots are stronger than bullets, we will campaign. We will campaign hard, we will campaign relentlessly for liberal ideas, democratic values. We will campaign for a green and a more equitable society for all. We will campaign in universities. We will campaign in communities. We will campaign with trade unions, with farmer organizations. We will do it online. We will do it offline. We will do it on ground. There are so many different battlegrounds, be it in the parliament, be it outside of the parliament, be it in the local elections, be it online on the streets, be it in cultural spaces, and here we are, second mission, the battle of ideas. Progressive against regressive. Liberal against conservative. Democracy against authoritarian. Equality against privilege. The people against the military. The rest against the rich. Hope against fear. The future against the past. If we win the battle of ideas, we win all other battles. It is the battle to write a post prayut new political order. The third and the last mission, we will build a people's network spanning 77 provinces across Thailand. A people network. A network for people who are ready to fight and protect democracy. If there is one thing Thailand can teach the world, I think it is this. If you want to know what could happen if democracy is taken for granted, is here in Thailand. Thailand is the best case example of what could happen if democracy is taken for granted. It, it is what happens when no one protects democratic, democratic values, no one defends human rights. As we all know, freedom has a cost. No one pays the cost. Everyone loses their freedom. And that is precisely why we need people's network strong enough to withstand the force of the junta. The people network, the network that is ready to fight um, for democracy, it is a network of people who are ready to risk their lives to rebuild democracy in this country, who are ready to protect and nature the dawn of democracy once we topple the Prayut regime. This is the three missions of the Future Forward Movement. Changing the landscape of local politics, 
pushing the boundary, the boundary of the battle of ideas, and building the people network to fight for democracy. Many of you may ask why. Why do we have to do all this? Why we couldn't just stop? Many people ask me. Let me tell you why by giving you one example. Two weeks ago, during the no confidence motion debate in the parliament, we exposed evidences suggesting that Thai army operates information operation against the opposition parties and against the people who oppose the rule of the junta. At the essence, it is a government-sponsored, militarily-operated information operation with an objective of installing hatred into the society using this information and fake news. From the leaked information we gain, our love calculation tells us that there are thousands of military officers working day in and day out, sending fake news and hate speech to discredit us across all social media platforms. And if you wonder why Thai people of two different political views hate each other so very much, we now know. We now have the answer. It is because hatred does not happen naturally, but it is manufactured systematically and intentionally. I repeat, systematically and intentionally. The fairy tale the establishment wants us to believe is that democracy is the problem. Divisions among the people are the problem. Democracy doesn't work here in Thailand. Intervention from unelected power is necessary. The army is the white knight. That is what they want us to believe. All these lies aim to give legitimacy to the suppression of human rights and to the rise of the authoritarian regime. And perhaps, more importantly, more importantly, hatred kills. This information operation is a license to kill. It helps justify killing people of different or opposing political views. How many in the past have died because of, because of this in Thai history? Haven't we learned any lessons out of it? And these people, they died for free. No general change happened. No one has been held accountable. And that is why we have to continue, because we believe the foundation of this country should best on love, not hate, on trust, not suspicion. And ladies and gentlemen, if one example is not enough to convince you that it is this is not the time to stop our journey. I would like to give you another example, which might be more relevant to international stakeholders. The case of human trafficking and the case of a man named Pawin Pong Sirin. As is commonly known, Thailand is a very important base for global human trafficking business. Thailand was ranked tier 3 in the Trafficking in Persons or TIP report. In 2015, Pawin, who was a police major general at the time, led an investigation into human trafficking in Thailand. His work led to the prosecution of around 100 people involved in the case. The victims in this case were mostly young, young Rohingyas some aged as young as 12 years old, many aged around 15 to 18. These kids, these people, spend months in small cabins, floating in the sea, without enough food, without enough water. They were tortured, they were beaten, they were treated like animals, 
and many of them were killed. The most senior government official being prosecuted in this case is Lieutenant General Manat Kongpan. And not only Lieutenant General Manat Kongpan, there were also four other four military officers prosecuted in the case as well. The involvement of the military in human trafficking is clear. This government claims that this case is its performance, resulting in the status upgrade from the TIP report, Tier 3 to Tier 2, eventually. And yet, Police Major General Pawin, who led the investigation, who was supposed to be promoted, who was supposed to be recognized, is now living in exile as a political asylum in Australia leaving his wife and his kids here in Thailand. He fears that his life is in danger for what he did. He knows that Little Net Major Manat is not the top of the human trafficking food chain. You might want to ask yourself, who could basically threaten a police major general to the point that he has to flee? You might want to ask this question to yourself. A sane administration would give Kun Paween more time and more resources to continue his investigation because human trafficking activities continue to these very days. It is likely that Kun Paween won't be able to come back if there is no regime change. And if justice cannot be given to Kun Parveen, who is a police general, how can ordinary citizens receive justice they deserve? Government-sponsored, military-operated information operation must end. No military of modern state in the world does information operation against its own people. This is wrong and cannot be accepted anywhere. Human trafficking in Thailand must end. No human beings should be sold as commodities. They have fathers, they have mothers, they have brothers, they have sisters. They are like us, they are like you, they are like me. Without the reform of the military, we cannot stop this. And without a true democracy, we cannot reform the military. Unless and until the principle of military under civilian government is firmly established in this country, we cannot solve any of these problems. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the time to stop. This is why, this is beyond me or the future forward party. It's about our future. It's about the future of our children. They deserve a better society. And it is our mission to hand them a society better than the one we received from our parents. The last point I want to make here is the fact that we are living in a very exciting moment. This is the moment when the door of opportunity opens widest. This is the best chance in decades to bring about general democracy in Thailand, thanks to the failure of the regime in managing the economy and in maintaining social justice. It is now that the idea of military reform is generally accepted. It is now that the idea to totally amend the 2017 constitution is generally accepted. And at its core, at the heart of this political, political crisis, is this question. In Thailand, who does the power belong to? And the awareness of the importance of this question has never been higher among the people. So I believe it is high time that we seize the opportunity given to us by the Thai of history. If we fail 
we don't really know if and when opportunities like this will ever come again. So we maintain our journey toward a chat destination to a new vehicle. And I wish we could receive support from all of you. We maintain our cause, Thailand in 3Ds, democratization, decentralization, and demilitarization. And with that, I would like to end my talk here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kuntanaton. Um, I'm going to let you go straight away, Peter, and explain to us what you're going to do with the uh, block of seats that you still have left in Parliament. Many people would argue that the parliamentary strategy for the opposition, for a radical opposition like yours, is, has been closed off by the maneuvers that have ended up with your party being dissolved. How do you see it? Member of the press, distinguished guest, Ladies and gentlemen, and friends of Thailand, let me begin by surprising Kun Thanaton that the first time that I hear him speak was here at FCCT. <laughs> Back in April 2018, I was sitting where that gentleman was sitting there, and it was him that he used the word, ideas are stronger than guns, and it was him who spoke about you know, how democracy sometimes need a occasional disruption uh, to shake up the status quo. And that was his words that shook um, the fire inside my heart. And it was probably like six or seven months after, I think you called me in December. So it was April that I listened to him. So I knew who he was. I knew he w who he was about, but he didn't know much about me, but he made a call and we had a discussion and it was about an hour. And that's, that's when I joined the party because he, he said in, in a sentence that Thailand needs a, a structural change and not just like a small policies where you give out cash and things like that in order to realize uh, the potential of uh, Thailand. And it's quite ironic that I'm sitting here next to him a year later. <laughs> I think let me, let me address the big question, you know, the elephant in the room. Uh, the question is probably what next for the remaining 55 MPs. Um, the short answer to that is fighting forward. Uh, we're, we're still pretty much solidified uh, together in our ideologies, in our plans, in our strategies, in our policies. We still aspire to take uh, Thailand toward a meaningful functional democracy with a fair economic system. We aspire to make Thai people equal and bring the country together to face many challenges that define our generation. A rise in extreme inequality, the retreat in democracy, and a specter of a warming global planet. As a representative of the remaining 55 MPs, uh, the values of our new party will be defined not just by our words, but also by our actions. There were five bills that our previous party has submitted and our new party will, will submit and will continue in the parliament. First, a bill to cancel 17 orders of the military juntas. Second, a labor protection bill that expand maternity leave and increase minimum wage along the CPI. Third, a bill to end military conscription, which we will be believe it will modernize our military into an effective fighting force that is equal to the threat of the 21st century. Fourth, a bill to end monopoly over liquor industry, in which I am uh, the person in charge to end monopolization of liquor and to realize the quality and the value of communion and the spirit of Thailand to make sure that the world smell the Thai spirit. <laughs> Fifth, our next endeavor, which I am also the person in charge, is the Clean Air Act, the Clean Air Bill that will solve pollution, including MP, uh, PM 2.5 crisis once and for all, like our other countries, uh, our friends here, uh, like our neighbor here in, in Singapore. 
Meanwhile, you know, the parliament is in recess. Uh, we still have many committees in the parliament in which our party presides over. We are pushing an agenda to end legal but inhumane forest eviction cases across the country. Do you, do you know that there's 80,000 cases of people with land justice issues that's second to drug trafficking here in Thailand, just people fighting for their right to, uh, to live, pretty much uh, a place for them to live, and that becomes quite uh, an inhumane uh, eviction cases across the country, and that needs to stop. Um, fight for the rights of local and indigenous communities over natural resources and industrial and mining practices that polluted our country. Protect human rights and freedom of expression to ensure that protesters and students, younger generations, the future is theirs, that they can participate in political process without facing retribution. Uh, I think we need to confirm that the right to assembly, peaceful assembly especially, is part of an effective partic participation in democracy. Going forward now, our new party is going to, once it's established, is going to set up working groups to tackle many challenges that the country is facing and the government is lacking in terms of their response. These challenges include the drought crisis, which is probably the worst in the past 50 years, uh, COVID-19 outbreak, which is part of the concerns of the entire international community here, the student protest flash mobs that have sprung up across the country, and PM 2.5 pollution crisis and economic problems. Not yet, not yet a recession, but it's a, it's a problem for a lot of people here in Thailand. All in all, our party aims to be the voice of the voiceless, the hope of the hopeless in this society. Our brand, to some people, they might call us progressive, they might call us center left, but our propositions are driven more by common sense than by any political leaning. It is a common sense, there should not be any legal legacy or the junta in a demo democratic society. It is a common sense that the minimum wage should earn enough to make a living of yourself, of your family, of your parents. It is a common sense that the richest man in this country should not be in business competition with the farmers who make $1,500 a year. We believe that our country should return to these common senses in order to make our people equal and bring the country together to face the challenges of our generation. Thank you. That concludes my talk for the time being. Thank you very much, both of you. I mean, that's a, a, quite a divergent strategy. There are going to be a lot of questions tonight, and I want to encourage all of you who've got questions to get a chance to put them there. I can't even see the microphone at the moment. Julian's found it. Um, just before I do that, can you explain, either of you, what the relationship between the party in Parliament and the movement is going to be? This is something that's complicated. <laughs> Other movements in, in, in one, sen in one yeah. sentence, shared ideology. Different paths, different mechanisms, and absolutely no influence over one another. You heard it here. Marwan, I'll let you ask the first question. Yeah, hi. Uh, Marwan Markenmark of Nikkei Asian Review. I mean, the, one of the inspirations for your party was Podemos in Spain. Or you seem to have drawn inspiration from them. but. That kind of ideology was possible in a country or in a region that respects democratic culture. Uh, as you've uh, explained, the problem in Thailand is that democracy is seen as something antithetical to the establishment. So while, yes, you're going to challenge the white knights, how do you get the Thai public to accept that actually democracy is the better alternative to a military regime? Thank you. Uh, I couldn't hear properly, but your, your question was about possibility. possibility. I heard the word possibility. May I repeat uh, that? Basically, uh, I mean, your party drew inspiration from the Spanish party, Pademos, when you started. I think uh, your, uh, Ajahn uh, Pierbut mentioned that some time ago when he was 
explain the foundations. I mean, these parties in, you, in, in Thailand, you're up against a system that basically is hostile towards democracy. So while you're presenting new ideas, the, how do you convince the greater public that democracy is actually the solution to get over the logjam in Thai politics? Thanks. Yeah, but the, the question is, uh, I think as of now, I think the public is convinced uh, what you've seen in the past uh, two or three weeks uh, from the newer generation uh, is starting to move towards provinces and moving towards labor that they are demanding change and they are demanding uh, participation within uh, the every part of the society. I think my role and responsibility to make it possible to your question is to make sure that we uh, stand for ideas and values to make Parliament does what it's supposed to do. And I think there's a couple of things that the Parliament is supposed to do. First is to represent their electorates, represent the people. I visit them, I listen to, the, to their problems, and I speak on their behalf. Uh, second, obviously, uh, Parliament make laws. And obviously, I, I uh, explain to you what fi our five laws were about. Some are political, some are social, some are economic. And the third one is to... Uh, keep the government accountable and we tried our best during the no confidence vote. Yes, we have prepared for what, three, four months uh, before the dissolution on the 21st and just me taking care of macroeconomic situation. I was the first to speak for the party and there's remaining uh, 10 or 12 of my colleagues who, to me, I think they did the job uh, perfectly given the circumstance, given the situation, given uh, three day of three day notice pretty much before they had to do their job uh, inside the parliament and three of them outside of the parliament so I'm very proud of them and yeah and two of them are, are right here with me uh, Kun Pichan and Kun Sri Kanya the e remaining MPs that are here to support us um, and, yeah, yeah, outside the parliament it's, J it's Just uh, Kun one well. point that Marwan was making there which I think is a valid one which is that um, politicians have been successfully demonized here in Thailand as corrupt and hopeless and parliament is in a way people view parliament as optional and the essential power resides of course with the palace but with people underneath them and you know how do you build up people's respect for parliament and for democracy as the method by which you govern when for so long they've been told that this is just where people get take bribes and, and make money. You know my, my argument is that that kind of old politics happened for the past two decades, for 20 years, and the new ge newer generation who are graduating from college have experiences, some of them, and they started to, they used the word slippery slope argument. They're starting to see that it's a slippery slope that once you try to consult an outside power, or outside policies, or talking about intai is pita, tipatai in English is paternalism, meaning you know, you're not solving the problems by yourself and you're look, always looking for higher power, someone who's more paternalistic to solve the problems for you. So I think, you know, yes, there's, there's a chance that we might not succeed, but as long as we're not giving up, then there's hope and, and the newer generation will ca keep coming up and keep coming up and that's part of change, you know. It's not a straight line, it's gonna be a zig and zag and that's how democracy is. And uh, I've traveled to various places through my life. I've, I've been to Cuba, I've been to uh, places where democracy is not uh, a choice, and I've seen how 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 the difference is uh, with my own eyes, and I'm sure the newer generation will start to see it. Even uh, yeah, older generation who have uh, been uh, in in colors, who have been in opposing colors, are now joining us for a cause. It's no longer about left or, or right. It's about you know one percent and ninety nine percent. So. Polarization, bipartisanship, these are the, are the kind of words that are being introduced in Thailand where it was introduced uh, in your country back many, many decades ago. So I still have hope. Thank you. Next question, please, Pia. Hi, uh, Pia from the States Times. Um, my, my, my question is a bit uh, technical. Since the party was dissolved uh, over the technical issue of the loan. So I'm wondering how the new party will be funded from now on. Will it re be relying on loans? Uh, will, still, will it still function from the remnants of the loans from Kuntanaton before? And will the scale of the functions of the new party be limited 
uh, or be lessened uh, in a way because of this 10 million baht cap. Thank you. No more loans. Uh, <laughs> and I lend and, you my and, watches. And no watches either. <laughs> no more loans and no watches either. We'll be the party of the people. We'll do a lot of online uh, fundraising. We'll do a lot of on-ground fundraising. We'll keep it to the cap. We'll talk to a lot of SMEs who are affected, uh, who wants to change the country. Um, obviously, it will be a, a, a leaner party, but so we'll keep uh, that uh, in mind. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that even we took out the loan, but because of merchandising and online fundraising, how it's done in the West when it, com when it comes to campaign financing, we were able to pay back the loan. So um, we'll take it as a go. We understand now that politics, you, you need to be solid. It's more like a, a marathon and not like a sprint. But it's a smaller party, but the quality is not going to drop. So that's, that's how we're going to, to, to keep moving. Do we have another question? Don't be shy. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. <laughs> I think everyone's worried about Hi. the fact that you actually mentioned the loan while you were here at the club. Yeah, I could have <laughs> just yelled it over there. Um, actually, I was uh, interested in both your perspectives from the perspective of a movement and a political party both of you, you talk about like being inclusive and reaching out across society and different colours can join. But um, what is the strategy? It's clear that um, some of the other opposition parties like Pua Thai are, you know, searching also for new directions and election results uh, did show some trends, including some disillusion with some of the traditional opposition uh, Parties. So, what I wonder if each of you, Kuntanaton and Kun Peter, could talk about in the grassroots and people's movement outside of Parliament, how you would propose to draw all these people who were so loyal to initially Taksin and then broadly Puatai, um, as well as other uh, other uh, parts of the political spectrum, and also Kun Peter in the parliamentary uh, context as well, maybe. Each of you could give a perspective um, on that. I, I, I have an issue with the echo, but your question was about grassroots movement, correct? Sorry, is, the, is this better if I say this okay. like this? I was asking about, you talked about how it's open to all colours, you all know, colors, and joining yes. together yes. and reaching out to all across society, mm. right? But I'm just asking uh, in the light of some of the voting patterns we saw mm. and also that... Uh, Pua Thai had yeah. a very loyal following, but now we saw quite a shift in the last election. But how do you propose to actually reach out? Do you envisage a coalition in Parliament? Because I think one of the main problems up to now is that there has been an opposition that's very segmented. Mm. I mean, clearly, I mean, particularly, do you envisage reaching out to Democrats? Uh, you've, lost, you've lost some MPs already to Boom Jai Tai. I mean, how do you propose to bridge these gaps? And also, Kuntanaton in the people's movement out there, there's a lot of very loyal Pua Thai supporters. How do you reach out to them? Or in fact, Democrats, look at the voting patterns in the South. The Democrats had a lot of support amongst ordinary people in the South. Do you think that you can cobble together a grand coalition? That's the only way, surely, to... Uh, become a, a, a huge political force? Well, I don't want to talk about the, um, the issues of political parties. Um, last year I was here talking about the loan I gave to the party and my party was dissolved a year later. <laughs> and if I talk about anything regarding to his party, maybe next year his party got dissolved. <laughs> I don't want that to happen, so I let things about political parties to Peter. Let me talk a little bit about the, um, the movement we are um, trying to build from now. I think it's, it's yeah, I think we, what we want to do is we want to focus in local elections. I don't, know, I don't know how much you know about local politics in Thailand, but local, local administrations in Thailand, um, 
do not function very well. And we want to change that. We want to, um, uh, the question earlier was, how do we make people understand the, the importance of democracy? I think it's interrelated with, the, with, the, with the, this question. And that democracy is about the quality of lives, the quality of your schools, the quality of your hospitals, the, ho the quality um, um, of the, your healthcare system, how the government spend your money. And by doing local politics, entering local politics, it's, it's closer to them, it's much closer to them, you know. In the parliament, what you do is you basically passing bills, passing laws, which is very far to the everyday lives of the ordinary people. But local politics is about the quality of your streets, the quality of the light, the quality of the school next door, you know. So, and that's the reason why we want to do local politics. We want, we want to prove them that good politics give them better quality of lives. And that's why we want to focus there. And that's what we're gonna do. So, it's, so when we talk about doing local politics, it's about building a movement as well as walking the talk, show the people what we are able, or able to do, you know. So that's, that's, I think, goes hand in hand, local politics and building the grassroots movement. You know, let me add one point here. In local politics, there's never been a debate about, say, city of Chiang Mai. In the election of the, um, of the president of the provincial administration, I take Chiang Mai, for example, because I think all of you know Chiang Mai. In the past, in the history, no president of Chiang Mai provincial administration ever come to a debate and to show their vision what Chiang Mai could look like 10 years from now or 20 years from now. What Chiang Mai is capable of. So this time we want to make it different. We want the local politicians to play our game, the game of solid policy, the game of constructive policy. And if we force them to play our game, we win the election, we lose the election, we win. The people win. So we make them coming, stop, I mean, we force them by installing more competition into local politics so that they stop, so that money will not the most effective means to win the election. We want the people to understand this, and this is one of our core missions. Is that, do you mean you're actually going to be sending try, candidates? Trying to hold people accountable or doing civic p education? Because you, you're a movement, you can't take part in elections. Well, yeah. I can't, yeah. but, I can, but I can help campaign mm. for the candidates who we believe they shared. And they the could be from any party. Ideologies. From any party. Hmm? If, if that could be from any party if you think the candidate's good. It will be from the future forward movement. Yeah. I cannot run. Definitely I cannot run. Right. Mm. Uh, as for myself, let me address your question by breaking it down. Um, when you talked about Pua Thai Party and you talked about the unity of uh, opposition party, Two nights ago or three nights ago, um, myself, Kun Vichan, Kun Sri Kanya, all the MPs, Kun Tanathon, had a chance to, had a, to, to hold uh, dinner uh, together with the leaders of all the opposing parties. And we, uh, we, I, I tried to convince them, I, I asked them for uh, a strong, one unified light of democracy. I mean, there were lessons that we needed to learn, but it was, it's a unity of the opposing party that the people really, really requires. And I think uh, we, we had a, a, a glitch in our long road, but we have made an understanding and going forward we'll be uh, communicating more to make sure that it's a stronger unified opposition party when the uh, parliament starts again. Second part of the question was about uh, grassroots movements and polarization of politics, the opposing colors, and how we were planning to, to depolarize and stop this uh, color game. Um, a lot of times, from my own experience, when we talk about social needs instead of political leaning, 
Uh, we talk about land justice. We talk about marijuana legalization. And yes, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, PM to uh, environmental issues, it doesn't matter what color you come from. In the past two decades, it affects you. Um, marijuana legalization, for example, when we were trying to push, there were people from uh, the yellow side uh, who came and tried to push this social need because they, they, there's a need for them to fix their health that the modern medicine couldn't help them. On the other hand, the people on the, the red side uh, 10 years ago, they also had cancer and they also wanted to find an alternative way to fix things. So because of these policies that are based on social needs and not just about the past, that's how we uh, bring people together. And we, uh, I think I walked 20 kilometers uh, as a rally together with all colors in the past together. And we were talking about how we have to push this and make a change uh, as an alternative for people who have no other uh, alternatives. I have epilepsy, I'm epileptic. So uh, it's been, I think it was my time 20 years ago in Texas that I had a chance to try uh, medical marijuana where uh, Tegretol, the med modern medicine, couldn't help me. So I knew what it's like when you need something that is an alternative to modern medicine and people from both sides also have these experiences that are similarity uh, to move forward in a new direction. The third part was about coalition of politicians. We've never thought about that, but we've thought about coalition of people. We've thought, we've thought about coali coalition with the people who have the need for strong public health, for a, a equal economics for uh, a better schooling system and things like that. So yeah, we are not afraid to, to reach out to those people who might be uh, visibly opposing to our party. We're, we're not afraid to listen. I mean, talking is, is important, but listening is even more important, especially if they don't agree with you. Thanks very much. Sean, your question. Uh, Sean Crispin um, with Asia Times. Uh, my question is for Kun Tanatorn. <clears throat> um, you, you're, you're speaking about um, this new um, outside of parliament movement and I think what's been very clear for all to see so far is this initial manifestation um, in the student movement, um, something that I think has captured a lot of imagination considering the youth-based um, support your, your party commands. Um, three, if I might, related to this. Um, you, what, what role has um, your movement, um, not the party obviously, um, had, if any, um, in, in, in organizing and galvanizing um, in, in, in making these, um, this, these in, at least initial protests happen. Um, two, uh, considering the extraordinary um, historic um, symbolism and significance of student protest, um, do you see this as perhaps um, the most effective avenue um, for your movement, if this is something that could be sustained with your movement's support, um, that obviously you kind of already have the government spooked, um, considering um, the, what student movements have done in the past. Um, and three, um, there's been a lot of talk on, on the outskirts here about parliamentary process and so forth, but the fact of the matter is you've kind of been kicked out of that process. Do you not see a, a student movement um, that starts to resemble something akin to in Hong Kong um, to be in the quickest and fastest avenue um, to affecting political change in the country? Okay, question number one, what role? Um, there's none except that they inspire me, and I believe to some certain extent I inspire them. So I think it's about inspiration. Um, when it comes to the, when it's come to operation, when it comes to organizing the protests in the universities, we have no part in that. And that's why we also um, very surprised to see them um, stand up and speak for themselves. Number two, the most effective avenue? Mm, definitely. Defi um, I wouldn't call it the most effective. I think going forward, you need a cooperation of all sorts of people, you know, not only the students, trade unions, also very important, grassroots movement, also very important, you know, and definitely um, MPs. The battle inside the parliament, also very important. So I, I believe that you, 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 you need to work together. It's not only, you, you cannot let the students fight alone, um, that's going to win you democracy. I think this time um, you need all, all um, 
all sorts of people, you know, to join hands in bringing about change. Um, and with that, I'm saying this with again, I emphasize on on this very moment. I think this is the best opportunities we have in decades, in decades, to make change genuine, to make change real. We must not lose this opportunity. We must not. So going forward, working with um, political parties, working with students, I'm ready to compromise. I'm ready to compromise when it comes to tactical, when it comes to the tactical dimension of the movement. But I will stand very firm on the principle, on the ideas and on the ideals. But when it comes to the tactics, I think Future Forward Movement is ready to compromise in order to incorporate as many people to join the movement as possible. Um, question number three, Hong Kong model? Hmm. Uh, I hope not. I hope not. But, but you see, this is a perfect storm. You got the people anger um, from all sorts of causes. Look at the, the, the failure of this government when it comes to managing the macroeconomy. Look at the failure of this government when it comes to the management of the, the coronavirus. Um, look at it when it comes to maintaining social justice. I think, I think it's, it's and, and what is going to happen in the second quarter and the third quarter of this year is that the economic situation will um, um, keep on declining. So, so we are not doing this, I'm not doing this. If there's someone behind the student movement, it's General Bayut himself, basically. <laughs> so, so the, I hope not. Um, what I believe is that the movement, the student movement will grow bigger. And I'm, I'm convinced they understand the importance of the importance of non-violence principle. I do understand. I'm, I'm convinced that they do understand this. So I hope not. I think more importantly, more important than, than we would, you know, will the student movement be the most effective avenue? I think the question right now is what will be the common demand? The demand that will, that's able to, that's able to pull, to include all the groups of people. I think on the table you have basically two ways. One is the vaccination of Kun Prayut Chan Ocha as the Prime Minister. And the second is the, 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 to dissolve the, the parliament and fresh elections. We have to understand it. With or without General Prayut, the regime continues. So vaccination of General Prayut will not help. We have to demand further than that. This demand will not, the students will definitely not satisfy with this. The students will definitely not satisfy with the vaccination of General Prayut. I think the demand, the demand has to be more toward the, to dissolve the parliament and calling for fresh elections. I give you one example why. In March 2019 election, 35 million people went to vote. And out of 35 million people, about 47% of the people voted for political parties who campaigned against the continuation of military regime. 25% voted for parties that support the continuation of the junta. And 27% vote, voted for parties um, which didn't declare the, their stance on this matter. So you can see that 40% against the junta and 25% for the junta, the gap is huge. The gap is huge. And that, and people questioning why. What happened? We didn't vote for General Bayud and why General Bayud has become the Prime Minister after the election. People are starting to question this. So the result, the, the, 
the reality does not reflect the results of the election. The reality does not reflect the will of the people. And that's why I think fresh election, um, the demand for fresh election is more suitable for the current situation, not the vaccination of General Payut Chan um, as, for, as for myself, um, to the students, or to the younger generation of, uh, of, of Thailand, my message to them is that I hear them, I understand them, I appreciate them. Um, 20 years ago, I was part of them. I understand that the tension is rising, and there's 500,000, according to the government statistics, who will not be able to find jobs. And 800, out of that 800,000 new voters, 500,000 will not be able to find jobs. So that's what their concern is. I understand them because, you know, as adults, as an MP, I think we need to confirm the right to peaceful assembly as part of uh, democracy. Um, our party the way we think about this is that the purity, the purity of their assembly, the purity of the protest should not be de de delegitimized by uh, a condemnation that is masterminded by any partic particular adult. And I appreciate them because uh, the trust that they have uh, for us, I think what they speak, when they speak, they speak for their future. They don't speak about former future forward party. They speak about the future, so it's, 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 if it's gonna be successful, if it's gonna be a victory, it's their victory and not our victory. It not, has nothing to do with us. Thanks very much, Chris. Hi, thank you, Chris Baker. Kuntanaton, uh, that was a wonderful speech. Um, but we all know how powerful the conservative forces are in this country. You're much too dangerous. They have to put you in jail. So my question to you is, do you think they will put you in jail? Okay. <laughs> and you have said already that you won't run away. So when they put you in jail, what will you do? Because for a leader like you, you know, unlike Nelson Mandela or Gandhi or these kinds of people uh, who have this sort of career, the time that they are in jail is extremely important in shaping their careers as well as, <laughs> as well as what is going to happen next in the next few years here. Over to you. Well, first, first of all, let's be very honest here. I don't want to go to jail. My youngest son was um, 15 months old. So I want to watch him grow. So I don't want to go to jail. But it's not depending on me. It's depending on them. Whether I'm going to go to jail or not, it's, it's not on me. So the, um, mm, I don't want to, but I'm not going to play if it comes. That's all I could say about this. It's become quite a tradition fleeing from uh, prison sentences in Thailand, so you'd be breaking that tradition. <laughs> Next question, please. Uh, Peter Trainer, club member. Some of the question I want to ask has been partially covered, but it, it's a question for both the movement and the party is uh, how to get your message across to the, to the people of the country, either students or for local elections. What's the, the difference between your interpretation and the government's interpretation of the difference between a flash mob and a political demonstration or a political discussion? It seems that you're going to be restricted that whenever you try to get your message across, you're accused of creating a mob and creating disharmony and disorder when all you're doing is either stating what your policies would be or agreeing with the crowd that, you, that you're addressing. So is your interpretation different 
for political gatherings is it different from the government's interpretation and will it inhibit you or will it restrict you from getting members for the movement or, or the party? Well, I think for them, uh, there, is, there is no differences. Anything anyone that stands against them is, is their enemy. And they have um, the same way of, to, uh, they always have this same pattern of dealing with this, taking Panika. Before the Panika um, gave a presentation about, um, about the government involvement in the 1MDB case um, before the non-confidence motion. The government, instead of finding the fact, setting a committee to explore what's behind the story of 1MDB, what's the level of government officials involving in this case. The first thing they said the next day was that we are gathering the information to prosecute Panika. That was they did to me when I organized a flash mob. That's what they're going to do to the students, what they have done to the political um, activists, that what they have done to human rights defenders over the past five years. They try to prosecute these people. So it doesn't matter if you are a student, you are a politician. It doesn't matter if you are human rights defenders or political activists. They see you as the enemy. They see you as um, um, uh, they see you as the obstacles for them to hold on, for them to retain their powers. So I think that is dangerous. And I'm, I'm asking you, please, please, please do whatever you can do to protect these people. Well, not me, but, uh, you know, Panika, my colleague, one of my colleagues, um, exposing the evidences suggesting that there actually is a militarily operated information operation. And there is, it is likely that he will soon be prosecuted as well. So there's no space, um, democratic space in Thailand. And I'm sorry, I'm so very sorry to the Thai journalists. I think Thai journalists aren't do their jobs very well in protecting whistleblowers, in um, fighting, you know, um, exp exposing the truth, the people should know, the truth that the powerful doesn't want the people to know. So I, I, I think um, we need protection to these brave people who have fought in their own ways to bring our society better. They need protection and, and, and if there's anything you can do for them, I ask you to protect these people. So I was one of the four, right, during that flash mob and the remaining MP here. I think to answer your question very quickly, I think there's a, a big underlying differences when it comes to assembly. You know, you could call it flash mob, you can call it uh, whatever, but it's people assemble uh, in order to voice their concerns. Um, without any violence, it was one hour. We, our MPs, with our citizens, clean up the space one hour right after that flash mode where we want to sit, send signal to the government. I, I think that's part of a democratic process. Uh, dem democracy is not a four second vote in the ballot and that's done, right? I mean, it's effective participation, it's freedom of speech, it's checks and balances, you know, thinking about 1930, classic Robert Dow of Yale University when he was talking about five uh, elements of democracy. It's a basic part of democracy. It's what, dem it's what makes democracy gross. And that's what how, how I view it. Uh, obviously, um, the charges against me and my three other colleagues say otherwise. So <laughs> I think that's a, a big enough underlying differences that, that show what they think. When people get together and they voice their concern, it becomes something else. That's, that's not, uh, you know, that take uh, uh, democracy, democracy in Thailand a step back instead of uh, a step forward. Yeah. I think it's obviously one of the problems in Thailand is always that 
when people file law lawsuits against you, however unreasonable they are and however unfavorable the process, you can never criticize the courts, and nor can any outsiders. It's uh, being used more and more in this region, uh, the use of law by governments to silence people. Next question, please. Uh, good evening. My name is Olivier Evra. I'm a social anthropologist working on social and political aspect of air pollution in Thailand in general and in Chiang Mai in particular. Um, so my question is twofold. Um, first, how would you contribute to a Clean Air Act in Thailand concretely? What would, which kind of measure would you see to see implemented? And second, how would you specifically work in Chiang Mai since you are talking about Chiang Mai quite a lot? Uh, where you probably know that better than me, but it's a very deep, historically, socially, economically problem, uh, air pollution in Chiang Mai. So what would be the measures you would implement in Chiang Mai specifically, and how those measures would be different from the ones that are currently implemented by the, by the current government? Thank you very much. Okay. Pollution in Thailand is like a ham in a sandwich. The government has the uh, master plan, but it doesn't have the power, the Clean Air Act that gives the power for eight different ministries to coordinate together. Uh, to them, w when I was uh, the chair of the Natural Resources Environment Committee, I asked the person in charge to come in and he asked uh, ask him the five reasons of air pollution in order and this is what he told me. He said first is uh, from agriculture, uh, burning of sugar cane, burning of uh, rice fields. Second is uh, manufacturing, which belongs to Ministry of uh, Industry, right? The first one was Ministry of Agriculture. The third one is transportation, which belongs to Ministry of Transportation. The fourth one is about uh, electricity, which is coal. 11% of Thai electricity is, is done by coal. There's still about 11%. And that's Ministry of Energy. So the, guy, the poor guy who comes in, he's a director at general level, almost retiring. The poor guy cannot answer the question because all the causes of air pollution in Thailand belongs to some other ministers um, who, who are higher than him. It's the kind of Clean Air Act in, in Denmark, in Sweden, Swedish Protection Agency, where I'm looking at Sweden at, at, at the mo as a model. Singapore, if something like that happens, it's this uh, environmental protection agency that Thailand doesn't have. You have to have the act first. That can uh, segment the problem and say, okay, uh, no more agricultural burning for the next one week or the construction side, which belongs to the Ministry of Interior, has to stop. No one has that power in Thailand. So that's, that's the upper bread of the ham. The guy has a master plan to do this and that, but he doesn't have the power that gives him to do it, right? And the, the lower bread is the action plan. Um, like I said, the causes, when I kept asking for the sources, so then we attacked at the sources of air pollution, of course, he, he would say something like stop burning and no more, no more cars, no private cars, stop schools, work from home and this and that. But if there's no action plan, then the civil servants at the very bottom, they don't know what to do. So that's why the, the, the problems recycles itself um, throughout. And that's all the environmental problems in Thailand. The last act that we had when it comes to environmental protection, I was 12 at the time. So it's been a long time that it was revised. So that's why when I uh, went down to Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, Skonokon, and see all the mining practices and this and that, and I say, okay, this is what we lack. We lack the action plan, the lower bread, <laughs> uh, Clean Air Act, like many, many other countries, which is the upper bread. So that if this, that's the case, we have a, a, con a coordinated effort. I mean, that, that kind of uh, power structure, that it will allow the prob problem to fade away, otherwise it will just be like this every year. Yeah. Thanks very much. So As for ahead. Chiang Mai, hello, hello, hello. As for Chiang Mai, my apologies. We, we are not sending our candidates to compete in the Chiang Mai administration, local administration election. So we don't have um, city policy specifically for Chiang Mai at the moment. Apologies. 
Thanks very much. I've never heard pollution described as a sandwich before. But <laughs> it's, it's not just air pollution, no, no. Jonathan. It's the, a lot of problems here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a power structure. Yeah. Sorry, I, I confused no, it's, power it's, structure with sandwiches, but yeah. I guess it was a smoke. You, you see the picture. Yeah. <laughs> Next question, please. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Ken Korana, and I have a question for Kuntana Thorn. Uh, you spoke about uh, Rohingyas and human trafficking. Um, as to what I feel, uh, the, our security forces have kept our borders secure from illegal immigrants. Um, I don't know what tactics uh, they use, but whatever. Uh, our borders are safe. Um, there are Rohingyas in India, Bangladesh, um, Myanmar, uh, Malaysia, and, uh, all over the place. How would you keep uh, safe? How would you handle if you are in the government? How would you handle that? What, sp what specifically do you, are you addressing? Which and I realize it's, it's Rohingyas. Do you yeah. mean human trafficking, or are you talking about Rohingyas? Actually, uh, Rohingyas, more to Rohingyas. Yeah, how, how would you... Well, you are, are, you, are you referring to how Thailand should handle it regionally or yeah. Rohingyas in Thailand? Yeah, Rohingyas in Thailand, those who come here and uh, uh, been sent out in, in the past. Uh, well, uh, okay, I guess that's a broader yeah. question, I suppose, about um, undocumented, the very large undocumented population in Thailand. Um, I mean, Rohingyas are obviously are particularly vulnerable, but there are many, of course, from Myanmar, Cambodia, and others. Well, for me, a democratic Thailand would be in the best position to help assist the issue of Rohingyas. I mean, look at the trade, look at the relationship we have with our neighbor. Um, a democratic Thailand would have enormous power to, to leverage um, against this issue with, uh, with our neighbor government. I mean, we are talking about, I don't know what, a million people being displaced at the moment, if not more. Right? This is a huge issue. And it's just, and it, we are turning blind eyes on them. We have all the resources in the world um, to help. The world want to help this. And we, Thailand, the neighbor, doing nothing and actually making things worse by seizing this opportunity to, to do human trafficking activities. I mean, um, I am totally convinced that that if we are in power, I mean, if he is in power, we can do better on this. We can do better on this on this front. Um, we can use our trade um, with our neighbor to leverage on this. We can um, pull ASEAN behind us, the Malaysian already doing their part, the Indonesian government also doing their part. So we could, you know, be a force for the better to talk to the Burmese government, in my eyes. And more importantly, I, I think it's not about, it's not about the Rohingya alone. I mean, we could contribute more. Look, look at what happened in the Mekong River. Mekong River is dying. Mekong River is the, one of the most important rivers in, in Asia, you know, and it's feeding, what, 100 million people? 100 more than 100 million people, depending on Mekong River, and now it is dying. And why is it dying? Because there's no international cooperation between the upstream, right for, from China, right, to the downstream in Cambodia and Vietnam. There's no international cooperation and who want to talk to China who's in the upstream? Can any single country have enough power to negotiate with China that the dozen of mega dams you are building upstream is killing the liver? No, you have to work at least the inland, inland Southeast Asian nations have to work together on this and to talk to China as one. And who is in the best position to do that? It's us, it's Thailand. And why we are not doing this is very, is very simple. The answer is very simple because but you Chan Ocha needs international recognition. He needs China. So there's no way he's going to compromise his relationship with China 
for Mekong River, I believe. So that's why I'm saying we are losing opportunities and democratic Thailand could contribute more to help solve the world's problems, be it the Rohingya, be it the Mekong River, or be it the environmental issues. We have the potential, we have smart people all over the place, all over Thailand, but we are not maximizing our potential. We are not, not, not maximizing the abilities of these people. So it is a lost decade, a total lost decade for Thailand. As for myself, uh, I have some experiences in the fishing industry where there's a lot of uh, migrant workers, a lot of them undocumented, and the key problem to that is the undocumented word, the lack of transparency, and all I can say in a very quick uh, summary is that I feel like there are some uh, local or some established, no, some local Some people in the industry who benefit from the lack of transparency from for the migrant workers to keep being uh, undocumented, and I feel that that like that has to stop, and that has to stop with decentralization by ha having a decentralized uh, cities who understand the the demand and the supply and how to treat them like a normal human being. Yeah. Thanks very much. Can we get the next question, please? Hi, um, my name is Jira Pon Chayasan. I'm an FCC team member and also a concerned citizen, so Kunathorn, Kunthanathorn, here we are again. After, you know, your last talk, it seemed like your party is dissolved. Um, I understand that Chris Baker mentioned that you don't want to go, you know, you mentioned that you don't want to go to jail. Um, this is two questions about, you are, are you declaring war on the rich? And what are your message to the Thai tycoons that are supporting the pro Hunter government? And also, Kumpita, if you actually have been invited to the coalition with our General Payut's, um, you know, sitting with the, uh, the Supreme Minister, would you join them and what would you be your three top three policies? War on the rich. You're, you're not entirely well, unwealthy yourselves, you two. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put it this way. In this stage, as developing nation, we cannot reject the law of big corporations. We need big corporations. We need big companies. You know. But the way they accumulate capital should not be regressive. They should be the one who go out and compete with the world, with technology, with innovation, in products and all services. You know, and bring that value back and distribute it to the, the, the supply chain. So that should be the role of big business in developing nations, right? Capture the value of, from the outside, using the innovation, the power of the people in the country. That's how the Japanese build their big businesses through the supply chain, having, for example, Toyota, as the national champion, go out and capture value added in the world and bring back to Japan. That's how Korea built their nation. But us, big corporations in Thailand, they are not going out, but they instead lobbying for a regulation, lobbying for a law that could give them the power to monopolize the market. And that's the difference between the function of big corporations in developing nations. So, no, we are not declaring the war on the rich, but we want to change the relationship between the rich corporations and me medium and small enterprises. Big corporations should not come down and compete with medium and small enterprises using the law that favors them, favor big corporations, but big corporations should be, the, should be our flagship to compete with the world. So that is something I believe Pita understands very well and he will change it when he's our next Prime Minister. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to answer your question, I think, I think we mentioned a couple of times that uh, with or without General Pe Youth is not really the issue. Uh, I think we all entered politics because I, we think that the system is rigged. 
how can 1% hold 67% of the wealth? Uh, according to Oxfam, how can uh, there be 80,000 cases against our own citizens who just want the right to live uh, just because there are uh, legal and inhuman evictions of uh, land cases? Um, so if we were to design our party policies or strategies, uh, I can confirm um, with a strong voice that it will still be a strong shared uh, solidified policies that we have talked about in the past uh, one year, it's already ingrained in our DNA. We don't need any other influence from other people who are dissolved uh, with the party. Um, it's the meaningful democracy that means demilitarization, take military out to where they belong, not uh, governing our country. Uh, it's about economic uh, equality, ending monopoly, increasing transparency. It's about better environment, better sustainability. It's not about uh, privatization of profit and nationalization of loss. And this is what I mean uh, by how the system is rigged in this country. So if it's just uh, a political party that says, OK, let's give uh, subsidies to the farmers and, and not tackle the structural issues of Thai agriculture, uh, that's something that we don't want to uh, get into. So. Uh, it's really not about an individual, but it's really about the system. Without General Payut, but this system of uh, elites, of uh, conservatives, of uh, uh, other people, establishment uh, continues. Uh, that's something that we'll still continue to fight for, against, not for. Thank you. <laughs> Next question, please. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Nirawit. I am not a journalist, if that's okay. Uh, my question is about Cobra MPs. Uh, it was a really big deal when the Future Forward Party started a year ago, because you guys were a group of normal people who never wanted to do politics, but got together because you were tired of the status quo. But now a year later, we see that quite a few of your MPs have been bought and have become 14. Cobra MPs, uh, including Monton Pokai, who is your uh, district MP. Uh, my question is, what lessons have you learned, and what are some specific things you'll do to make sure this doesn't happen again in the future? Thank you. Well, 14 to be pre precise. <laughs> to be precise, it's 14. Um, what's the lesson I learned? Betrayal is common in politics. I learned it's hard, I learned it's very expensive way, very painful way. So, uh, betrayals. Let, 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 me, let me clarify one thing. We got recognized by the election commission to be a political party, official political party to be a legal entity on the 3rd of October. Um, just one, two, three, four, five, um, six months before the election. And we have to select, we have to choose um, our MP candidates before the new year, so we thought because we we thought the election might be you know in the fourth in the first quarter of 2019, so we have basically three months to choose um, 350 constituencies MP candidates. We got three months to choose some 350 people, so um, it was a big mistake. We didn't have enough time, you know, to 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 truly understand the motive behind their applications um, to be our MP candidate. So, uh, but this is the lesson I have to tell him because I, I wouldn't have an opportunity to do that again. <laughs> you know. so, so the, as for how do I feel about this? Um, these 14 people, 10 of them are constituent constituencies, MPs, and 10 of them all together collected 450,000 votes. 450,000 votes. And when we campaigned before the election, our campaign was very clear. We do not support military junta. So people who voted for us, these 450,000 votes, clearly they voted against the junta. And now the system, our system just allow them to move camp. 
450,000 people voted against the junta rule for these 10 MPs, constituency MPs. And when they moved camp to support, um, to cushion the, the coalition, the governing coalition parties, you know, they betrayal. They betray these 450,000 voters. They betray their promises to the people. And that's painful, you know. So that's how I feel. And Apologies, but you have to learn this next time when you choose your MP candidates. <laughs> I mean, the MPs have the legal, the, the right to move to the party that they want to be associated with, but I don't think they have the, le the legitimacy to do it. And I'm sure they have the price to pay. They already paid a lot. So it's really, it's for us, we decided to remain positive and stay united with the remaining 55 uh, to move forward. Uh, for those who move because of ideology, that's a different thing. But if some of them move because of monetary terms, I think they owe a big, big exp explanation for their unconstructive and poorly, purely transactional politics to the people who voted for them. Do you think they did go for the money? I have no comment. <laughs> 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 Sorry, do, do you want to follow up? Yes. Just quick, briefly, yeah. Uh, Sorry, Sorry the, the second part of the question was also, what are some specific things you'll do or to, to prevent this from happening in the future? Thank you. Well, I, um, we'll have... Uh, the remaining 55 uh, have uh, pledged their... their vows to, to stay with us. On March the 8th, uh, we'll have a meeting and we'll announce the, the new name of our party. And hopefully that will send a message to um, our society that uh, the remaining 55 will continue. Um, it's a lot of work to do within a year, uh, past one year and a half. Obviously, we made some mistakes. Uh, we definitely will learn from them. And now we have more time uh, we have uh, learned how to manage the party as an institution better. Hopefully we'll have a better, uh, a stronger committees when it comes to uh, selecting people who join the party without a rush. Next question, please. Duong um, Ramon, I have no affiliation at the moment. So in speaking about betrayal, Kuntanathan, I think our Thai people here, I'm here as a Thai citizen, we know very well What's the point of the last election anyway? <laughs> so that's, that's a real betrayal, we feel. Um, my question, just to give a bit of background, um, two years ago I was standing here asking you two questions when you make a first appearance at this uh, panel as a new uh, young blood, young Thai politicians, together with the Thai Raksa Shad party, it was already been this all before. I think we might be in the same event. Yeah, I was right there. <laughs> yes, yes, so I was standing over there. My two questions back then was about uh, the amendment of the constitutions of how could ever a political parties survive under this undemocratic, unfair, um, I would say we know by now, um, constitution to weakening the political party. That's one question. Another question was about uh, the 20 year national plans. Anyway, so forget about 20 year national plan, back to the amendment constitution, because tonight, I think neither one of you have mentioned that before. So uh, tonight, actually. So my question is um, where you stand on the amendment of the constitution, or there is another separate movement who are actually. Um, bringing that into the agenda. Is that still your main agenda apart from uh, demilitarization and democratization? Uh, where are you now on the constitution amendment to put the structural sustainable change into this country? I, I, I think we cannot undermine that. Thank you. Well, definitely we stand firm on this. I mean, without the total amendment of the 2017 constitution, there's, there, there's no democracy here. So when I talk about democratization, the first, the very first step is to amend the 2017 constitution. So you, you, you will see me going forward, campaigning for this. Um, I will be talking about this. My colleague, Pia Bud, will also be talking about this. Um, um, this 
this issue is too important to let go easily. I mean, without changing the constitution, you still have um, unelected powers dominating, dominating the Thai politics. Yeah. So, so don't worry about this. We still stand very firm on this. Um, for the Constitution Amendment, um, the Constitution of 2017, in, in a sentence, is a stiff vehicle in an agile environment. I mean, in their own words, uh, it has been designed to ensure that the generals remain in power. And as a result, uh, if you listen to the uh, no confidence uh, debate that I was in, I was talking about how political parties are made to be fragmented, the, the Senate appointed by the junta and the overwhelming majority of the prime minister voting independent organizations are empowered over elected bodies. If it's not amended, you know, we cannot unlock many things uh, that bind Thailand into this gridlock. The Senate, the independent organizations, the law of military and politics, the 20 year uh, national strategy. And that's what I meant by stiff uh, vehicle in an agile environment. Take, uh, take um, economics, uh, the economy, for example. You, have, uh, you, ha you don't have uh, the leader when it comes to economic policies. Deputy Prime Minister Somkid announced to be exact November 17th and December 3rd that he's no longer in, in charge of the economy of Thailand. And you have three fragmented parties taking care of all the ministries, ministries uh, transportation, you have industry, you have agriculture, all coming out from fragmented party because of this constitution. Because of the, the source of power comes from a fragmented uh, constitution and that's why the fragmented management. It's very clear that it needs to be amended. And yeah, people say it's almost impossible. You need one third of the Senate vote, right? 80, 86 out of, was it? One third, 84, 84 out of 250. But uh, if the people uh, is hungry enough for change for an amendment, and if they, they talk to their MPs and they reach out to the senators that, you know, it ne this gridlock needs to stop this year or otherwise there'll be no more Thailand. This kind of, this kind of appeal to uh, the people who, who has the power, the appointed versus the elected, uh, these are the things that, that can make it possible. They can make the impossible possible. I think in, in addition, if I would have framed the question correctly, is that what would be your involvement? But I think Kuntanathan has already answered that this is still ah, the agenda. Okay. Because it seems like there are separate movements who see, are campaigning on uh, um, amend the uh, constitution. But anyway, as long as it's already in your agenda, so as long as it happens, you know, whatever it takes. Let me, let me give you another fact. Um, Biyabut is still in the constitutional amendment, how do you call that, committee? Committee. committee. Um, so, so he's still there, and we're still pushing for this. You will see this constitutional amendment um, um, coming out and organizing uh, public hearings. We regarding to the to the change of the constitution, so you will hear this. Be about, I'm sure he will be working very hard in this committee. Thank you very much. I hope you'll forgive me if I say I'll take two more questions. I think we're running out of time after that. Next question, please. Sorry. My name is Nonga Pasham from PPTV Thailand. Uh, I have two questions. First one for Kun Pita. There was some news from election commission that the new party will use the name Gao Klai. It is correct, and if it is, what is the meaning of it? And will Kun Pita be a leader of the new party? And the second one, I would like to ask Kun Tanathorn. Since you are banned for executive politics for 10 years, but as you announced Future Forward Movement, and you said that you will focus on local politics, how can you be sure that you won't play a part in executive politics in 10 years? Um, for the first question, can I surprise you on the 8th? That's just a couple of days away. So we'll be making the announcement. I hope you're there. Um, the I second hope you won't be leaving us as baffled as Corn Chatty Cabinet did about how to translate the name of the party. <laughs> <laughs> that, that will help you on the 8th too. Uh, as for my personal uh, role of this uh, party that will uh, that we will all the 55 MPs will move to 
um, it's not just about me. It's a, a political party. It's a, an institution, and there's processes involved to select who who the leader is, who the secretary general is, who the registrar is. So I I have uh, no um, comment on on that one. They disqualified me from running political offices. I cannot be an MP candidate. I cannot be a local. Um, administration candidates, but I still am a Thai citizen. I can, I still have my right to talk. I still have my right to free speech. So I will support candidates who have, who share similar goals, similar ideas, and similar ideals. So I still can support them, but I cannot run. So definitely, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to run for, say, the governor of Bangkok. I can't. They disqualify me for that. But I can still um, talk about who of the Bangkok governor candidates I support. I could still do that. Yeah. So can we have the last question, please, Frank? Uh, Frank Fu from Guangming, Delhi, China. Uh, my question is to uh, Quinn Tanatum. Uh, just now, you talked you talk about the Mekong River issue. Uh, I have thought that I was listening to the speech of uh, Secretary uh, Pompeo. <laughs> just a joke, okay? No, now comes to my question. And uh, you said that Thailand does not dare to stand up and say no to China in the Mekong issue. Mm, before you make this statement, have you reached out to your Ministry of Foreign Affairs or have you reached out to the Chinese Embassy or have you checked in the internet? Uh, based on my very limited information, uh, last year there are complaints from Thailand that Thailand does not want China to dredge the river and the Thailand reached the issue and then China accepted that and already gave up. And very recently, just the early February, just during the Spring Festival uh, time, and uh, there's a drought in Thailand, and Thailand complained to China, and then China increased the volume of the water even during the Spring Festival. Thank you. Have you seen the level of water going through Chiang Lai? Xing Lai is the first point of Mekong River flowing into Thailand. If you look back, Don went to China, the, uh, the, what? Don, the Ministry, uh, Minister Foreign of Foreign Affairs, he went to China to talk about this, the, to um, ask China to open up the dams to let the water flow more into the, into the downstream Mekong River. And if you look, at the level of the water flowing through Chiang Lai, you see no change, basically. No change in the water, in the level of water rising through Chiang Lai. Chiang Lai is the first point of contact. So, the, um, no, I don't see, I don't see tangible um, outcome of the Thai government effort. Dawn flew there. It's in the news, everyone knows that. But if you look at the actual stats in Chiang Rai, where the water, Mekong River, first contact Thailand, no, there's no change in the water level. The um, relationship with China is going to be important for every country in this region. And it's a, you know, it's a, a difficult relationship because it's a very big and powerful country. And countries that have dealt with the United States will recognize the problem. I mean, do you, do you have perspectives on that? Because yeah. there are always dilemmas for governments. Let me put it this way. We should not, we, we should welcome the rise of China. You know, they are too big. We cannot say no to them. We should welcome the rise of China. And we should, together with China, pushing them to be a, glo a responsible global player. I think that's very important. You cannot deny China, a country with 1.4 billion people. You cannot. And you can't stop China from rising. So what we should do together is
to make the country more open, more transparent. We should do together is is to make them um, um, to play a more responsible role, not to prevent them from engaging to the world. I think that's not what we want. What I'm trying to criticize is not China, but our foreign policy toward China. You understand, you, you understand the, the, the differences? I'm not trying to criticize the Chinese government. What I'm trying to criticize when I talk about the Mekong River is that Thailand foreign policy in this matter is very important to the lives of hundred millions of people. And we could do more. We could put more effort into this issue. And we are we should, you know, we are in the best position to gather the collaboration among ASEAN nations in this matter. That if I'm in the government would do. Thanks very much indeed. I'm gonna wrap it up there and uh give a very warm uh, round of applause to our two-star politicians. <laughs> <laughs>